The following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know and join us in our pursuit for the truth. Enjoy the podcast. That's because of the hair, though. You look at him, you're like, that's a hot dude. You just keep talking with the Dutch in such angry Don't tones. worry. I, it's the French I don't like. Dutch are fine. What's bad about Osteen? Tell me one thing. What, he sold a seat to Kanye for six grand? That's not a bad thing. <laughs> All right. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Second Rate Saints. I'm one of your hosts here, Caleb. To my left is... Joshua. To my left is... I'm Colton, and to my left, I'm Joel, and to my left, it's me, Caleb. Sadly, we are missing Stuart, but uh, and we're Joel. missing Cole too. Oh yeah! Oh man, I said the thing. You said it. No, <laughs> yeah, they're the same guy. Anyway, Joel, you're yeah. looking very comfy. Oh man, I'm relaxed. Um, could you tell us where people could find episodes with Cole? If you'd like to see our uh, past and future episodes, uh, you can go to secondratesaints.com. Uh, it's probably the easiest place to find everything we're doing online. Uh, blog posts, book reviews. Um, even if you want to send in a question to the podcast, there's a chat feature there. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash secondratesaints or use the link on our website. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram or uh, the X. I, I almost call it Twitter again. Um, yeah, if you have a longer form question that you'd like to email to us, you can email us at secondratesaints at gmail.com. Yeah, that's the best way to, to go about it. Now, I believe the, the age-old question that has somehow stuck with this podcast for this long. Uh, Caleb, what have you read? I read a little book. It's only about 112 pages called The Christian Priest Today by Archbishop Michael Ramsey, who was like archbishop in the mid-1900s. So just shortly after World War II. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a collection of pseudo sermons, lectures, exhortations that he gave to um, people who are about to be ordained, right? Into the priesthood and di- diaconate. So it's, it's kind of his like, hey, you're going to be in ministry. This is, what it, this is what it means to be in ministry today, mm. right? Um, and it's so good. Anyway. It's tiny, so I I would recommend it. It is unapologetically Anglican. Um, I mean, that makes sense if it's for or people who are being ordained. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not really meant for like super public reading, but it, they did turn it into a book, and it's it is great. Hmm. Um, Why? So he's he he hits sensitive issues right on the nose okay. of the degrees within how people preach the gospel, and in like one aspect where he's. He talks about how there's a lot of people that preach the social reform, and then there's a lot of people that just preach there should be no social reform, really, but it's just repent and believe, but then you don't do anything or go anywhere with that. So, like, here's one of the quotes. Um, it is possible to preach the gospel of conversion without any sight of its social context. It is possible to preach a social gospel which omits the reality of the conversion of Christ. Mm-hmm. And in his... In, and, and that's kind of emblematic of a lot of, the, a lot of things in here. His whole thing is like, there are two ways to go about, there are two extremes or more extremes even right? that people in ministry end up falling into. Don't do those. You know, don't be so theologically minded that you aren't into me a little bit, but person that you don't even, you don't include Jesus at all. Exactly. Um, One of the things that he mentioned uh, that there's there's a lot of great lines, but there's one of them is, is that the, the individual person is of infinite worth for your ministry. You need to value the people but view them as Christ sees them. He goes on like, you can be the the best theologian, know the best theology, know the, be able to preach the best, but until you actually, your heart breaks for God's people like Christ, you aren't really a priest. You're not really a, their pastor, not as Christ would have you to lead and lead them. Mm. Um, So there's others like some, like there's some, banger line kind of prayer that he has at the end of one of his lectures which is um lord take my heart and break it break it not in the ways not in the way i would like but in the way that you know is best 
And because it is you who break it, I will not be afraid. For in your hands all are safe and I am safe. Lord, take my heart and give me your joy, not in the ways I like, but in the ways that you know are best and that your joy may fulfill me. Mm. And like that's really good, yeah. Coded throughout the whole thing is a cruciform cruciform view of pastoral ministry. You mm-hmm. should articulate. It, it costs Christ to minister to humanity, and you are going to participate in that. And the beautiful aspect of what that is, like that's, it's so good. Okay, I'm, I went to Bible school, right? We well, we all did, and we read books about ministry. This is the best book I've ever read on ministry. Wow. Okay. Um, but you guys know that I was not a big fan of a lot of the books of ministry. I also don't read. think the bar was high at that point. Yeah. yeah. We, were, we were also hyper, hypercritical of it during yeah. that time too. So, yeah. um, Josh. <laughs> and if our professors are listening, no, we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> okay. Caleb, out of five, would you give this to a random person to read? Not even close. Okay. So that makes it a two, right? Ah, it is a three. Oh, wow. Okay. Reason being, because it's so good. I think that the, the average Christian for newer, could read this. For newer listeners, Caleb rates things based off how willing he'd be given to give willing to give it to of, normal people. As things get lower in, this, in, the, in the out of five, it kind of becomes more average. But a five out of five book to me mm. is like, I would recommend it wholesale to any and everyone. That's the perfect okay. book. A four is like, it's amazing. I love it, but I might, I might have reservations about wholesale recommending it to any and everyone. A three is like, it's great, but eh. it's got its uses. Yeah. Now, of course, the quality of the content of the book also comes into factor whether or not I'd recommend it. So things get backdoored right. and mixed up in my rating scale. I would rate it a three simply because the sample of it is like, who is this applicable and who would it be beneficial for? Is you. The, yeah. Or people interested into in ministry itself. I, I think that there are many, the majority of this book is not just Anglican. The majority of the book is about ministry in general. And I okay. think anybody could, could, benefit from that but there are certain articulations that it's like yeah that's only going to be mm. for the anglican minded well even from the the quotes you read they do sound very generally applicable and also very beautiful yeah it's it's really good he the, the there's a wild punch where he's just like some he's responding and preaching it was like where's god today in regards of like post world war 2 and his whole thing is like hey we need to revive the doctrines of god's wrath and judgment you don't, where's God? He is here in judgment. And then he just comes out swinging. Mm. And it's like, I, that came out of nowhere. And so the, he doesn't, he doesn't pull his punches. He's very pastoral. It's, I'd recommend it. But Josh. Okay. The cover. It's not a good cover. No. <laughs> Poisoning the well already. <sighs> that too many, too, the Okay. Here's the thing. There's too many colors that I'm colorblind. <laughs> There's like two colors, yeah. <laughs> no, this whole building. It's all red. Front. Oh, that's true. Maybe I'm colorblind. <laughs> it's also got the like the classics band on uh, the side. That's gross. That band. I love and, like, that. Like, people if you're going to do a band no idea, down like, the length of a book, do it by the binding. Yeah, don't. Not at the end. Ugh. By the, where the pages. Anyways. Um, I give it a three. It looks like a commercial on British television. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's a actually a very specific critique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and for that reason, I do not like it as a book cover, though I have no problem with British. So that's a great commercial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm giving it a one and a half. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. What about like some of the garbage? We've had some awful ones on this that you've given that to. What about the, like the early church doctrines by Kelly? Oh, that was a one or is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's like. Only point one better than that? Yeah, because it's got a building on it. Mark another on the chalkboard for... Oh, the building is half a point, by the way. (laughs) Okay. We just introduced a new rule in the Josh's ranking system. Buildings have a point. No, it's not... Only skyscrapers have points, though. Buildings have a point. It's... I love this segment. This is my favorite segment. Where we talk about images that That other people can't can't see. (laughs) It's got... It's got... An aesthetic appeal. It's just in the wrong medium. It's got colors you can see, though. 
barely some of them dude i'm looking at shadows and texture changes not okay here's a here's a hot take for me probably not a hot take i find that classics labeling is like just as bad as now a major motion picture label. Oh, it's like terrible. I find it very irritating. Really? Like the blue I don't and think gold it's from nowhere VHS is, is bad. Like if I if I pick up a book and it's like, oh, this is a beautiful, you know, um, hardcover book, and it's like Signet Classic. I'm like, oh, dang it! Why'd the you ruin only it? company that does their like branding well is Penguin. Penguin does do well with their stuff, yeah, yeah, because it's a little more subtle. Right? I only buy mm-hmm. when I buy a book, like say I buy the Hunger Games book. I don't know why Hunger Games specifically, but would that have a classics label on it? Absolutely, uh, no. What? Um, <laughs> I only <laughs> buy the versions of the the movie versions that has the picture of the actors. Oh, on it's it. you. You're the worst. <laughs> You're the person. <laughs> You're the one who's driving those sales. You vote with it's your dollar, me. and you voted for the wrong candidate. <laughs> Excuse me, we didn't get political up in here. I'm going to get political. I vote political. for Jennifer Lawrence, okay. <laughs> yeah, I vote for Jennifer Lawrence. Um, uh, um, I tribute myself. Speaking of voting that's not an election, <laughs> uh, we're talking about Calvinism today, boys. Woo! Well, Woo! we're doing an intro and an overview of Calvinism. Rich with the Calvinism. Canada's a dort. Five points of Calvinism. But first... Why, why would we do an intro? Because we all acknowledge that very small topic other than more than one episode is needed um, for both theologies. Um, We haven't landed on how many episodes each on Calvinism and Arminianism, but for us to contribute anything of value to this conversation, other than just another summary, um, it, it needs to be more in depth. Um, because a lot of the problem with the conversation between Calvinism and Arminianism is lack of depth. It ends up being surface level. We end up reading past each other, yep. looking past. And people talking past each other. Exactly. And so if we want to do that conversation well. Got to explore it in its full depth. Yeah. We, we got to, like, even as a Calvinist myself, I want to be able to express Arminianism fully so that when I disagree with it, I can crush it. Um, sure, bud. Wait, what? <laughs> that was that was, that was the joke part. The fight. Mm-hmm. I'm learning then, my enemy. I'm like so percent on your side. I'm yeah, like, and, then, <laughs> and then so Joel, who's yeah. not a Calvinist, um, who knows? He can fully understand Calvinism and crush me. So, that's, that's what I fully intend to do, Josh. Yeah, get him. And if there's one thing that people expect from second rate saints, it is disagreement. Hardy yeah. debate. No, I'm kidding. We do it all the time. <laughs> no. Um, no, we have varying views on this stuff, varying perspectives. Um, and that's important, but part of this discussion, like I was saying was a lot of the discussion is misunderstood. The, like we talked about in the infused and imparted, um, and imputed righteousness episode, um, the conversation that people have and the conversation that theologians 400 years ago or theologians in the ivory tower are having is different. Um, in this one in Calvinism versus Arminianism, a lot of people fall into free will, human free will versus God's sovereignty Mm -hmm. in everything in life. Uh, Determinism and autonomy. Yes. And it it ends up becoming the philosophical conversation. Whereas Calvinism and Arminianism are debating what are the mechanics Mm -hmm. of salvation, soteriology, and it's two different schools of thought. Um, and Calvinism as Caleb over here is going to present is not, there's a lot of terms, Calvinism, reformation, big R, small R reformation, um, that get co-opted and mixed together. Yeah. So like, it's kind of a passion of mine. (laughs) It is. It comes out every now and then. Sometimes I, I, sometimes it comes out when it shouldn't. Um, people will say, and it's fine. If, if somebody walks into a room and says, I'm reformed, you should think, oh, so he's, you know, Dutch reformed, Canadian reformed, Presbyterian, that sort of stuff. You're like, okay, understand. But historically, in historical theology, and there's nothing wrong with calling with a, in historical theology, um, Anglicans and Lutherans are reformed. And so what the person that walked into the room is describing is I subscribe, well, they might be part of a reformed church like Josh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they might go, well, I'm reformed because I follow the Genevan school of soteriology. That would be the the school that came out of 
uh, Zwingli, but ultimately Calvin. And that's why mm-hmm. you get Calvinism, right? Mm-hmm. And they go, well, I'm reformed. However, when they say I'm reformed and they mean they go to a, let's say a Presbyterian church, they mean capital R reformed. Yeah. In the that church. Sense. Exactly. Or if they come in and say, I'm a Calvinist, they mean, again, the Genevan school of soteriology. However, in terms, when you, if you flip back and start reading historical theology and, and you understand the, school, the Genevan school of soteriology, that'd be the theology of salvation. Mm-hmm. It's not exclusive to the Genevan thought. There are other thoughts floating around at the, mm-hmm. who are in the reformed camp. Mm-hmm. And even all that is the Genevan school of soteriology isn't present in Calvin's institutes. Calvin talked about more. In fact, I think he talked, spent far more ink on other things than just soteriology in, let's say, the institutes. Yep. Namely, love ecclesiology and yeah. pneumatology. I, I personally love his stuff on pneumatology in mm. the institutes. It is awesome. Yeah. Well, and you even, like, we all went to a Pentecostal school. Mm-hmm. They can't stop quoting him in the pneumatology books. Yep. He's so good. But everywhere. I've never heard. I've never seen so many Arminians come up to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he, he's great. And, and in fairness, he actually stands out compared to his mm. followers after, because they don't have as well of an articulated pneumatology understanding of writings. Yep. Calvin's followers didn't have as articulated a pneumatology. And so when people say, well, I'm a Calvinist, they don't mean generally speaking, they don't mean I follow the right, like I, I, follow, I read the institutes every day. I read the institutes of every day and I follow Calvin. What they mean is what became of Calvin's soteriological system. I hold to mm-hmm. in the same way that I reformed. Well, I hold the Gene, the Genevan soteriological school yep. that they ended up even, getting dominated by the Dutch. Yeah. And they might not even believe that far. They just specifically mean tulip. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like the way you said the Dutch, the Dutch. Well, it became Dutch, very, very yeah. in like was, ingrained into the Dutch. You, you just keep talking about the Dutch in such angry don't tones. Worry. I, it's the French well, I don't like. Dutch are fine. Yeah, I'm it's French. <laughs> so is Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets a pass though. Yeah, but he's not like real French. He abandoned yeah. it for Geneva, so. And, and I respect that. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, anyway, that's I enough talking on guys. the French. <laughs> Point being. No, it's not. They do enough on their own. It's okay. <laughs> Point being. And then a non-denominational or a Baptist Hello. who says they are reformed, I think are appropriating the word because reformed theology means so much more. This is cultural appropriation. <laughs> You're uh, cultural of the, uh, what of the Dutch? Yeah. Okay. Nope. <laughs> He's advocating for cultural appropriation. No, I'm saying that you're grabbing a term. It's like when it's like if, if a reformed quote unquote reformed Baptist walks up to a Lutheran and goes, you're not reformed. It's like, mm-hmm. What? <laughs> yeah. And so when you were to study these terms and you go online or you read a historical book, know that those terms are just conflated and confused. Mm-hmm. And even us here today are going to confuse them. And that's kind of just baked into the pie now. Anyway, yep. back to Josh. That's what happens with pop theology. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you're arguing over a 400-year-old document and yeah. we're just talking about a 1,600-year-old discussion on theology. And, and let's salvation. be honest, the Baptists have been out of control with adjectives for a while. Now. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. Oh, and it's, yeah. it's kind of like how like Lutherans... All evangelicals are kind of like that. Most, that's, that's true. Most Lutheran theology, at least in my opinion... The best parts of Lutheran theology are just Melanchthon stuff, but they're still called Lutherans Mm -hmm. in the same way that people call themselves Calvin, Calvinists, even though a lot of their stuff comes from the followers after Calvin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but don't say that Mennonites follow Menno Simons because they don't like that. (laughs) (laughs) Don't we follow God? I don't, I think if you asked like 99% of Mennonites who Menno was, they'd probably not be be like, it's a small fish. (laughs) That's my joke, guys. I can leave now. Um, (laughs) So, short little history. Pop theology is fun. Yeah. It's like pop history when people are like, hey, did you know that this thing happened in history? And it's like, okay, that didn't actually happen, though. You heard that online or whatever. It's the same thing with theology. And Calvinism and Armenianism tends to be like that. Yeah. A short little, and I mean the briefest of histories. Mm Mm-hmm. 
uh, the canons of Dort, which is the document, the cre- the confession of that the five points mm-hmm. are explained in. You made up tulip. those words. Yep. Um, Dutch just do that all the time. Dort. Dort. Um, came from an international synod of reformed people held in Dordrecht, Netherlands, in 1618 to 1619. While the Synod accomplished many other things as well, one of its main purposes was to adjudicate a theological controversy, Arminianism, concerning the way in which believers received the benefit of Christ. The canons, therefore, are a polemic in purpose, articulating Calvinistic beliefs in direct rebuttal of Arminianism. There's wars going on. The Reformation Wars are occurring, various of them. Um, also just wars between the countries. Um, so at this time, the Netherlands is fraught with conflict and controversy. Yep. And so a lot of the, the fact that this comes out is there's a lot of angst mm-hmm. about all this. Um, a lot of Protestantism is forming. And so there's a lot of varying, you know, Menno Simons, all the guys we've talked about yeah. are all cr- there's churches and followings and there's pressure to solidify doctrine at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's like the situation it's in. And mm-hmm. then of course I wouldn't be much of a Calvinist if I didn't say that the canons of Dort were built on the canons of Dort. Oh, in support of the Dort fort. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that somehow related to like Fort Knox and like John Knox? I don't, I don't think so. Oh my gosh, we got like four different connections there. Yeah. (laughs) Is that related to the uh, fort and the door should be open? John Knox is the the Presbyterian guy, right? Yeah, who's the reforms uh, Scottish. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) It doesn't make sense. (laughs) There's a lot of history that we can go into, but essentially, and we'll get into these more in depth in this episode, kind of summarizing what each point is, but the common term used is tulip which is a an acrostic um to help memorize and it stands for total depravity unconditional election limited atonement irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints not to be confused with tulips which the dutch are also known for yes um very cultural (laughs) it was kind of like that's why that's where tulip came from that's why they made it right yeah it's almost like it's written in english not in Anyway, tulip is an English word. What? <laughs> a lot of uh, that doesn't sound right. Words are f- spelled very similarly. Between it's the true, two actually. It's very true. Yep, that's true. However, tulip is not actually in the canons of Dort. Yes, not they actually. are an after the fact uh, memorizing tool to help summarize the idea. Mm-hmm. They are reflective of the five points of the canons of Dort. Which are very generally, (laughs) yeah, divine election and reprobation, which is total depravity. Um, and then you have Christ's death and human redemption through it, which is unconditional election. Ah, sorry, yeah, and limited atonement, kind of. Um, they blur. The third and fourth point are human corruption and conversion to God and the way it occurs. Mm-hmm. And then the fifth point, the perseverance of the saints, which is the exact same. <laughs> Not to be confused with preser- preservation of the saints. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Which is what some people call it mm-hmm. for some reason. Perseverance of the saints. Well, you have a little bit of the different phrasing. Well, I mean, when yeah. someone calls themselves a five point Calvinist or a three point Calvinist, mm-hmm. this is what they're talking about. They're more yes. referring to the canons of Dort than they are to the tulip or there's some overlap Depends who there. you ask. Yeah. Yeah. It the, depends on what their reference point it is. It depends on how much they spend on the internet. Yeah. We Tulip that, is one of those things that like is a yeah. quick way to get into an argument. It's like, I'm people, a three point Calvinist. And they're like, oh man, get yeah. more from both sides. Yeah. 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 I know people on Reddit don't read. So <laughs> they read, they read the Wikipedia article. They don't actually read the canons themselves. So, yeah. So yeah. that's, I mean, like that's the short introduction to this, which mm-hmm. is those are the five points. Um, And to kind of get into it, like total depravity is the idea that humans were made good by God and they chose by eating the apple 
and through Adam, uh, all are depraved by nature. I knew Steve Jobs was behind it all. There is no act that could save us. There is one, Christ, and his life, death, and resurrection. Um, total depravity is the idea that we turn away from God, yeah. and we don't, as it would say in Romans, no one seeks God, no one is righteous, we don't desire him. We have remnants of the acknowledgement of the divine and morality mm-hmm. and goodness, but what those are becomes blurry in the human mind. Can I, can I ask, this is one of the points mm-hmm. where half-baked Armenians will sometimes, in their efforts to defend the Armenian position, mm-hmm. will actually go further than the Armenian position. They'll actually end up at really semi Pelagianism. Yes. Yeah. Semi Pelagianism or Pelagianism, holding that human beings are, well, Pelagi- Pelagianism is more so human beings are a blank slate mm-hmm. um, morally and they, they, mm-hmm. they incur uh, influences, right? But ultimately, they can, they have the ability to choose God, to choose salvation, right? Um, which obviously the Armenian totally like kind of in the, the interest un- of preserving the um to you to fall into other categories of free will um we'll say of course you choose to receive god you choose mm-hmm. to receive a present yeah. um but sometimes the armenian will stumble into arguing a half-baked pelagian or a, a semi-pelagian position of saying well every human being has the ability to choose God mm-hmm. apart, despite their corruption or despite right. their seeming corruption, which is since Augustine, and despite how much God actually influences yeah. them as well. Yeah. And so really classically, the Armenian position would be if I can try. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the very choice is the, the prevenient grace of God working in the individual and the, the concept that they can even choose is already part of their, part of God, the Holy Spirit working within them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not a thing that they could just naturally have apart from God, even, even to choose. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's how some people yeah. wander. That's the argument that goes. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, although I would say that most people like most Armenians and most Calvinists, I like Calvinists definitely have more of the, I say Armenians and Calvinists. I'm doing the thing mm-hmm. where I'm using the reformed word in the, colloquial sense and not the actual and, sense. And that's fine. But yeah, for the sake of this yeah. argument, I'm going to do that a lot simply because that's what I'm used to, but I'll try not to. Uh, Armenians tend to be fairly underbaked in their actual soteriology, whereas Calvinists hyper-focus on it a lot sometimes. I mean, go for it, Caleb. Sorry, you had your hand up. Um, well, I think recently it's, it's in the last like and Josh could probably back me up mm-hmm. on this. 50 years? It's hard to find a good Armenian theologian. Yeah. Like Roger E. Olson is, is decent. He's the one who writes against Calvinism, which yep. is part of a set of um, Michael Horton writes the for yep. Calvinism. It's a, it's a nice little set. If you introduction, we might even do that as what have the read. What have you read right. for some of these upcoming episodes? Um, but it, it's hard to find good Armenian theologians. Do, do you think that's because to be an Armenian theologian, you have to disagree fully with the Calvinist nope. structure? No. Because no. would he agree with, if we're going to do the colloquial of the five points? He doesn't agree with any of them. Right. Really? Does that, is that what Generally makes him because, Armenian? No. Um, and it's like, it, he doesn't agree with any of them because he would want to, he would agree with a modified version of T okay. or a modified mm-hmm. version of but yeah. if, it, if you, there's no modifications, then he would say no. Yeah. Um, but I think what it is, the reason why you don't see many good Armenian theologians, even though there, there are a lot, but they don't write on soteriology. I should preface that. There aren't mm-hmm. a lot of Armenian theologians who write on soteriology. Um, I think it's because a lot of the, the bastions of Armenianism has fallen into progressivism. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Right? Mm-hmm. Methodism is just a gong show. Yeah. yeah. The United Church is a gong show. Yeah. yeah. Um, Even Anglicanism. Large parts of large swaths of like staunch Armenian and staunch Calvinist in it yeah. as identity problem that it normally has. Baptists are in a 
constant civil war over it. Yeah, but a lot of the bastions of like the strong Armenian side of kind of yeah. they got swallowed up by the progressivism. Yeah, which is a bummer. Or yeah. they just don't care that much. Yeah, or maybe maybe not theology wise, but they, they have mean, other things they want to talk about. I mean, that's a historically valid point that Armenianism was more from a pastoral end. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I meet a lot of uh, Armenian sympathizers, but I don't. Yeah, but I meet a lot more people who are gung ho Calvinists. You know, like yeah. uh, I, I don't see a lot of people that I'm on fire for Armenianism. It's a hard thing to be on fire for. I think you're just yeah. I, I think Arminianism is is just the natural fallback of rejecting Calvinism. But I know historically it arises in the opposite, <laughs> uh, the opposite order. But yeah. yeah, and I find that most most people who tend to be Armenian, at least and, from what I can see, not theology wise, but just hmm. common lay person, um, is because they just they hear Calvinism and they think uh, determinism, and they're like, well, it's not determinism. There's free will exists, therefore I'm Armenian. Yeah, okay. well. And, to, to your point, like you were saying, like the, the weird history where it mm-hmm. seems like Arminianism is a response to Calvinism, but Calvinism, the, the, it, the canons of the yeah. were written as a polemic. Mm-hmm. And that's because some may not be historically knowledgeable on this topic, but mm-hmm. Jacob Arminius was a student of Calvin. Yeah. Yes. Of uh, John Calvin, um, mm-hmm. one of the major reformers. And so he, the big cheese, he challenged, uh, Calvin's theology on soteriology yes. in this topic. And then he, that started to spread through the works of Arminian mm-hmm. and the other students of Calvin and the other people in the school of thought, the Genevan school formed yeah. and got together and said, okay, let's codify what it is that Calvin taught. Yeah. So that, yeah. Which Arminianism didn't have the same experience of codification that, no. uh, yeah. or like solidifying doctrine that this came from because this was a group of lawyers and uh, <laughs> Arminianism was a group of pastors. It seems but, all they had was a country um, name. Yeah, after we'll, them. we'll cover that in another point. Armenia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> Come and on. The, I the, 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 the Dutch church at the time, because yeah. this is not, this was, they just, they signed this in and they wrote it in during a synod. Yes. Um, so to An ecumenical council, that's not ecumenical. A, a denominational council, but yeah. yes. <laughs> Not a council. Difference. Yes. Really? Um, yeah. Oh. Both are meetings. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't know there was a difference. Yeah, and it, there, there's, a, there's a specific difference between what we define as doctrine and confessional um, in at least the Christian Reformed Church. So you'll hold the, there will often be a moment where statement of the fact that they're crc at the synod stuff like that right um and which is your denomination crc yes mm-hmm. christian not reformed not Canadian reformed yeah crc <laughs> um and so one of the things that they'll say is i i confess like the that i believe that this is true the heidelberg catechism the belgian confession and the canons of dort mm-hmm. like we believe that those are confessional statements of faith of the christian reformed church as long as they agree with scripture right Mm. They, defi- so, they define our denomination. They don't define what makes Christians. Yes. Yeah. And we believe that's what cri- reflects the truth of the gospel. Yep. But ultimately we have to say that it's under scripture and it's what this group believes. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, unlike a lot of counter reformation mm-hmm. um, movements, most codified in the council of Trent. Um, And, and in parallel with like, like the Anglican 39 articles, let's say. Yeah. Um, does the canons of Dort anathematize those who disagree? There are points in which it brings it that I will say, because I am not as studied as a, I could be. And through further studies in seminary, I'll get more into this. But in the rebuttals, it often states that certain Arminian beliefs are Pelagian yeah, or mm. will fall to Pelagianism. Um, I, I, I could not say definitely because I. An- anathematized here, meaning that you are not Christian or you're not in the Reformed Church. Okay. 
I think we should step back and mm-hmm. just explain Caleb's statement in English for a minute. Um, wow. which, is, yeah. which is fine. It was a condensed and dense question. But uh, so there is a, a tendency in different councils and synods um, to present the idea that if there is a disagreement on what is presented, that you are anathematized, which is the fanciest word for excommunicated from the church. Uh, the Catholics used it first. Uh, Caleb's taken it back from the papacy. <laughs> we're bringing it um, back, which is again his word for the Catholics, and we're back on course. Is that cool? Yeah, but is there anything else we should describe? Many reformed churches many reformed would also uh, would present would, an would not, would not anathematize disagreements. Yeah, they would well, say okay. depends how extreme. Yeah, um, but like thirty nine articles, Anglican yeah. and the Canons of Dort, as far as I can tell from my reading, my first reading, doesn't directly anathematize those who disagree. Mm. What it does do is it says, hey, if you disagree on this, you're siding or at least sympathizing with heretics. Mm-hmm. And then they kind of, you know, they're like, well, yeah, be that was yeah, a little, little bit. And then yeah. they move on. Yeah. But yeah. That's different than what happens at the Council of Trent, which is, hey, if you say good works are the fruit of salvation or the fruit of justification, that's anathema. Whoa. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Mm. Which is what Trent says explicitly. But anyway. Well, yes. Good yeah. works is the fruit of. If you say that, that's an athma. I, I can give you the number. If and you there want. are definitely I didn't realize it was that far. It was in our. Uh, I think you've mentioned this before. It was yeah. in our. We we but just lightly me mentioned how hard it. that. If you believe that you do good because you're saved by Christ, you are not in the church. <laughs> well, if you say it's not part of justification, but oh. it's a fruit of justification, you're an athma. Oh, really? So, in other words, if you're a Protestant, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Council of Trent creates a lot of problems uh, for everyone. But Ooh, wasn't it like everybody. the 60s, though? No, that's the Vatican II. Vatican yep. II, okay. Council, that's, Trent. Uh, Council of Trent's way older. Sorry, never mind. I get them confused all the time. Council of Trent is the counter Reformation. Mm. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. basically, the Catholics going, what do we do with all these Protestants? Kind of started, slash, was in the middle of the 80s, 80 Years War. Is that the right one? I can't remember. Yeah. The, the, the whole wars of religion in yeah. Europe. Um, kind of a bad time for everybody. Enough about Catholics. If we're going to say the Canons of Dort, the closest they get to, if we're going to kind of present them in a, in a decent light, mm-hmm. Josh, would it be fair to say those areas where it's like, hey, if you say X, you sympathize with heresy Y, and yep. that's bad. Yep. But and they it, don't come out and say, if you say it, you're cut from the body of Christ. Yeah. It, it doesn't get extreme. I will say it flirts with it. Okay. The, yeah. Okay, so one of the the major summary of point one, total depravity, is where... Also called total inability sometimes. Yes. Which is a weird phrasing I found. And that's good because Mm -hmm. it is, it's actually found in point three and four of the Canons of Dort. But yes, article three is, therefore all people are conceived in sin and are born children of wrath, unfit for any saving good, inclined to evil, dead in their sins and slaves to sin. Without the grace of God and the regenerating of the Holy Spirit, they are neither willing nor able to return to God to reform their distorted nature or even to dispo- dispose themselves to such reform. That's the, the, the basis for total depravity is mm-hmm. I can't save myself. I don't want to save myself. I think most are, this is the one that most Armenians are willing to go. Yes. Mm-hmm. Except they might reword things or change mm-hmm. things or point out other bits of scripture. They're like, yeah, that might be true, but this is also emphasized or whatever. But yeah. And I think it's the one that we, mainly because it's, it's the one that is most universally held across the Christian yeah. West mm-hmm. specifically uh, because of it's, it's the byproduct, the, the strongest byproduct of Augustine's fight with Pelagian. Yes. And mm-hmm. so in the West, it's... All the, the reformers tea. are very po- pro-Augustine. Yeah. yeah. As they the, should be. The T in total depravity is, or total inability, is is the deepest of all mm-hmm. the in, in Western tradi- church yeah. tradition. Yeah. It's... And you'll see a lot of like Spurgeon says this, uh, various reformers throughout history have said this, that the teachings of the canons of Dort are what Calvin taught and what Augustine taught. Right. Um, is that correct? I am not smart enough to be able to discern those because I have not read enough Augustine and I have not read enough Calvin. So. 
I have my opinions, but I'll yes. keep them to myself. <laughs> yes. Augustine wrote the cans of Dorts. So. Well, I think where most people land is Augustine influenced Calvin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? A so lot. That, yeah. tr- that well, part at least is true. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. Influenced versus it is the theology that he spoke of. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That then leads us to the second point of Calvinism, often referred to as unconditional election. Uh, in the second point, well, in the Kansas door, it's just referred to as election. Um, cool. Yeah. What were you going to say? Have we moved on from total depravity now? How do we feel like we've so. said what we can say on that? If, do you have anything to add? Because that's good. What would be the Armenian opposition to that? Generally. I mean, we'll cover that more in depth when we do Armenian, yeah. I think. Um, but I, I think the opposition is babies didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> That is the opposition, isn't it? Sort of. No, it um, can be. It can be. That, that was where I was talking, discussing about the, the Armenian, if he's not careful, can backdoor into semi-Pelagian. Right. Where he basically which denies, is, hey, Pelagianism you know what? is heresy, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Like full on. Which is that, hey, you know what? We aren't objects of nature by, by we aren't objects of wrath by nature. Yes. Um. Plagianism, just rejecting the fallen state and calling yourself a blank slate. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and you have the, like, you, you have choose. authority to choose. Um, <laughs> the classic, I would say the, the sober classic Armenian position, mm-hmm. which I might be speaking out of turn, is that God's grace enables the person to make that decision. Um, and so, but that's more about unconditional election, which we're already blurring into, than about total depravity. And so, depending on how, like what Colton was saying, depending on how total depravity is articulated, um, the average Armenian doesn't have that big of a problem with it. Okay. Right. Um, it's a lot in the wording. It's more about what it means. Yeah. Um, and as the cans of Dort go on, it has more talks about more scripture ref- um, verses and stuff to back up what they mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. However, it does obviously make an argument based off of those things. And there's some hyper Celtic. 50 50 on there are some hyper Calvinists that would go as far as to say the the non elect can do no good yeah which yeah I, it, I believe it's even in the articles there where it's kind of like that's not what we're talking about yes um, but in the point it says oh where is it uh, are unfit for any unfit for any saving good that's not the same thing um, saving good is the is the point of the yeah. thing, but most people just think good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which I, again, it this gets into the whole like with everything theology. If you're talking with a theologian or someone in the church, or if you're just talking to people who have mm-hmm. read up on it, um, you're gonna have two different answers. Yeah. It's the same thing again with like history. Same thing with whatever people who are mired in the thing are obviously gonna have different conversations than the people who are just learning about it, mm-hmm. or people who even have trained in it, but aren't actually like theologians. And so they might focus on different aspects. This is one of those things. Yeah. And what I, what I as part of the CRC church really love about the canons of Dort, like with the Heidelberg catechism and with the Belgian Belgian. confession is it's not just stating the, an idea it's the, all of the articles in point one is a step-by-step of how this theology is presented. Um, same with Heidelberg Catechism. It's not, it's, it's not just a list of points. And I right. know other confessions do this, but it's, 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 a therefore. It's, a, it's a therefore this, therefore this, therefore this. It's kind of like the uh, 95 Theses, to be yeah. honest. And in fairness, the, the Armenians argument against Calvinism and the Roman Catholic argument against Calvinism and those in Anglican who are not Anglican mm-hmm. land, who are not Anglican Cold land. Blood. Anglican land. England. <laughs> no, that's, it's a term that a, that a prof I had at Regent okay, used. <laughs> nice. Um, they will, they don't, the claim, the, the argument against the five points is not, ah, it's incoherent. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the argument is normally, no, if the premises are true, that's makes sense. The question generally is, is, is it premises. biblical? Right. Yeah. Which, we will get into more so when we get yep. into our bigger episodes. Yep. yep. And so then we get into, are we allowed to move on? Yeah. Please. Okay. No. Um, 
I'm yeah. going to read the article election um, because it does. It does a good job. Article seven of election on the main point, which in Tulip is the second point. Unconditional election is election or choosing is God's unchangeable purpose by which he did the following before the foundations of the world by sheer grace, according to the free good pleasure of his will, he chose in Christ to salvation, a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race, which had fallen by its own fault from its original innocence into sin and ruin. Those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than the others, but lay with them in common misery. He did this in Christ, whom he also appointed from eternity to be the mediator and the head of all those chosen and the foundation of their salvation. So he decided to give the chosen ones to Christ to be saved and to call and draw them effectively into Christ's fellowship through his word and spirit. In other words, he decided to grant them true faith in Christ to justify them, to sanctify them. And finally, after powerfully preserving them in the fellowship of his son to glorify them, God did all this in order to demonstrate his mercy to the praise and riches of glory. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I think I have a similar attitude. The problem. I don't want to say the problem. There are words in there that mm-hmm. are ties to the other points when it's and he calls them effectively. Mm-hmm. Like, mm. Efficacious calling is one of the points. Yes. To be irresistible grace. And so that would be why I would have that hesitancy. But as for a whole. You're beautiful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> Simply stated, God through Christ before everything was created Mm -hmm. because of the whole plan of salvation saved a particular group against their will because everyone decided to disobey God. Right. And so by nature can't and he saved. And so different have certain qualities that God would want, but because they, they were all of the same equal human sin. Yeah. Totally depraved. To put you on the back foot, Josh, Mm -hmm. how would the Armenian respond? The Armenian would respond that it clearly states in Romans that due to foreknowledge, he, and then you get the Calvinist often quoted verse The golden chain. The golden chain, which is those he called, he predestined, those he predestined, he justified, those he justified, he sanctified. Mm -hmm so on in Christ, all that stuff. It's yeah. like the most quoted Calvinism. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Romans eight 30 around there. Somewhere around there. It's, it's in the best chapters of Romans. You know what guys? Um, <laughs> five to eight are the best chapters of Romans. Absolutely. Well, I don't nine just, is pretty good, but um, um, nine's pretty good too. I think the whole book of Romans is great. Oh, wow. Well, okay. I think oh, all but well, one chapter. I'm not going to say which. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, oh, that's good. Guys, my pastor's going to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Gonna, I, okay, you got it. Okay. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for, for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Am I missing? Yeah. Uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Mm-hmm. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Mm-hmm. Before we get into questions, I'm, I'm just going to further articulate that Armenian position. Mm-hmm. Um, what's presented in Dort is that there are individuals elect. Yes. Um, and then what the Armenian position would be, well, scripture. And you kind of see a bit of flavor in that, in that passage there, actually, mm-hmm. of those who are in Christ a grouping, a category of people have been predestined right. for salvation who are part of the elect. That category of people. Yeah, it's not talking about the individuals. Elect. Yeah, thus the argument at least. But what, what is a group of people? <laughs> yeah. Well, also, <laughs> yeah. what about like Paul's, you know, pastoral thrust of his care when he brings up, hey, you yep. have been elected. Anyway, Ephesians gets, I'm, yeah. I'm showing my hand. We'll talk about when we actually get to our election stuff. Uh, yeah. fully however the the point here being that before god laid the foundations of the world the argument is that mm-hmm. he chose certain people throughout time before and after christ to be saved yes and to be elect old and new testament yep 
Um, and it quotes Ephesians one, four to six and Romans eight thirty. And yeah. One of the big Armenian points against this is that which we'll get into more with uh irresistible grace stuff, mm-hmm. yep. uh, is not necessarily the arbitrariness of the choice, but the fact that if if they are elected from before time, they don't actually have any say in what they do, which is the point. But the, uh, most Calvinists who at least are willing to be a little more pastoral will say, well, you do choose. It just was that choice was made for you. Well, and the, the Calvinist response, if I may, Josh, sure. will be, that's a good thing. Because you are a sinful man who would reject. Sure. And so if it is in your nature that you would reject, it is mere, it is mercy upon mercy that his, that his election is efficacious. Right. And that's a, that's a very biblical argument. And however, the, the counter argument to especially something mm-hmm. like that is that, yeah, but people, if they didn't have the choice to choose good and they didn't have the choice, they also didn't have the choice to choose bad because God made them that way. Yeah. You get into, you get into that's the where does, the how does respons- stuff. Yeah. How does responsibility land? But we're moving on. We're not going to talk. Yeah. Joel. All about um, that. I realized that uh, although it has to do with election, it actually falls into the fifth point rather than. So it's the fifth point, article 12, which is the assurance of preservation mm-hmm. or the, no, sorry. Res- perseverance. It's, it's talking about the um, assurance of, of perseverance, which yeah. is uh, essentially the, the assurance that you are elect mm-hmm. um, as well. Um, and it says the assurance is an incentive to godliness. Mm-hmm. That's good. And it's, it's point here. And I think it kind of points out its, its main issue before it even starts its, its positive aspect. Does this assurance of perseverance, um, however, so far from making true believers proud and carnally self-assured is rather the root of humility of childlike respect, genuine godliness. And then it just kind of continues yeah. like all these positive things. Um, but I think what Calvinists so often get stuck with is not allowing that humility to come in. That yeah. there's not a humility of that insurance. There's an exclusivity. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's so many. Um, and you might get sympathizers, but you won't get yeah. people who fully engage with the concept. Because how dare they say Elitism. that there's some sort of um, Special yeah, people. rules that they fall into that someone else doesn't. Yes. That is antithetical to the evangelistic nature, even though especially evangelism is part of the canons of Dort. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially charismatic, of course, my background. Um, but yeah. I just noticed that that was one of the biggest things yeah. that stood out to me um, when I was reading through the Dort. So one of the, if I'm not going to pull my punches against Don't. Calvinism, mm-hmm. like, which hopefully, I, hopefully my confliction about it is coming through a little bit. If I'm not going to pull my punches though. People have heard of the, the stage cage Calvinist when everybody's like, I've, got this you know the 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 covenant theology has unlocked how i view the bible and how i understand christ's redemption of me and how it's not like you know beautiful cool cage stage calvinism never there, heard that there that, is there words. is a category especially in the young restless reform movement which if you want to find out what mm-hmm. that is go google that <laughs> um if i'm not going to pull my punches sometimes the Calvinistic system of theology ends up kind of be acting in this pseudo, dare I say, Gnostic way, in the same way that mm. conspiracy theories are. I have the inside knowledge. I have the track. It makes me, you know, more aware of the right. inner workings of the world and of theology. And that's not at all how theology should work. That's not how you should rationalize theology. But sometimes it comes off that way. Is that fair even to say there, Josh? Do you think I'm that's being I, too harsh? When you say pseudo Gnostic, that does feel very yeah, extreme. I said I, I wasn't going to pull my punches. I would say that 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 is not a problem with the theology, but the people that hold it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because even after, so every point in the canons of Dort has rebuttals that were, that they're preloading and then saying is wrong. Uh, and then at the very end, there's a conclusion section and it has uh, rejections of false accusations. Uh. And that lies in there mm. in like they already know that this is coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so. 
Yeah, like for example, that this teaching makes people care carnally self-assured since it persuades them from nothing persuades them that nothing endangers the salvation of the chosen, no matter how they live so that they may commit the most outrageous crimes and self-assurance. And that on the other hand, nothing is of use to the reprobate for salvation, even if they have truly reform performed all works of the saints. I, mm, that last bit might cause fighting, but we're going to skip that. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh yeah. It gets into the whole, how do you know if you're reprobate or saved, which we'll get into later. Um, yeah, I think you had uh, in the young restless reform movement movement towards this Calvinistic thinking in multiple denominations. Mm. I think you get what Joel's talking about there with the, the elitism. Uh, there's a little bit of elitism and arrogance, mm-hmm. which I don't is not indicative of Canons mm-hmm. of Dort yep. of 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 the Genevan school of of soteriology or of Josh. Josh, mm-hmm. you're great. And <laughs> you're at, lovely. <laughs> at the exact same time, you have the Armenians going anti-intellectualism. So, or sometimes they don't care, they don't love, they don't, and they start yeah. to be railed with the, well, the against the Calvinists, intention yeah. of Calvinists. Yeah, and basically, and say, you the, don't. Right, carry on. So, well, I was going to say that's you become a like, robot. Basically, again, the as like one of two Calvinists at our school of two hundred people, <laughs> I faced that a lot mm-hmm. of just like these people just saying snide remarks or blah, 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 blah. Like, do you even care about people? Yeah. Salvation? Like, why do you, why do you guys do missions? Uh, like we had a fun time right? in college, which I'm is not even a Calvinist. I still had a fun time, which is yeah. like, why do you do missions? Right. And it's like, because clearly as taught in the canons of Dort, how can someone and quoted from Romans, how can someone believe unless they've been told and how can someone preach unless they've been sent and commanded by christ yes i'm not saying you're reprobate <laughs> i'm not saying you're saved that is not my point i need yeah. to tell you the gospel that is my job yeah. yeah and and the whole point and and that's even in point one is you can't tell someone they're reprobate because you don't know reprobate meaning unsaved and never will be saved right yes elected to damnation maybe um, are we gonna get there well uh, is that part of this one uh, this point the the double, predestination. double predestination specifically P- stated in Dort uh-huh. is all men chose to sin mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. God chose to save a few. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but not all, not all reformed will go that way. Some go double predestination. Yes, but that's not the canons of Dort. So I don't care. For really? Sure. <laughs> there we you go. might not, but I do. Uh, <laughs> I, same reason why I care about the, the hard extreme Armenians. Yeah. I care about the hard extreme Calvinists in that way too. This is See, I, mean. I don't care about One the second. extreme. Okay. There sorry, we go. sir. No, go for it. Sorry, Joel. I, what what I, mean by I, 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 I want to hear it's wild after. What I okay. mean by I don't care predestination likes a summary understanding the teaching of the canons of Dort. Yes. Though there are those who still do and still claim that. I would say that double predestination, the idea that God chooses that certain people before he, time will go to hell and he has dest- and he has created them to go to hell specifically to sin and be evil. Right. Vessels be- of destruction. I'm oh. <laughs> no, just kidding. Oh, that's Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Paul um, states double, yes. For, we've talked around it, but double predestination is those who have been, God elects those who will go with them who will be saved, but he also elects specifically makes people to be damned people who will go mm-hmm. to hell and to be those vessels of destruction. Those whom he did not save. Yeah. Yes. But again, there's a difference between, uh, I want this person to go to hell. Right. And I'm making it so, and all have rejected me. I'm saving a few. Yep. It goes double predestination. In my opinion, is just, bold determinism it also makes the arg- it makes the argument more explicit but it also makes it also it's the it's a natural consequence of many calvinist thought mm-hmm. of much Selva- calvinist thought um however a, a calvinist can just say well i'm going to leave a, a, bo- a bigger box of mystery that covers that area that's that's a respectable thing to do that's fine um but it also, it also, it makes you butt up against some stronger Armenian arguments when you, when you commit to a double predestinary view. Yeah. I do not believe it is holding a box of mystery though. I, I think 
someone can say, I don't forgive me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yep. And I don't have a problem. I, I, that's not an yeah. accusation I, I, yeah, in, yeah. in my, yeah. in my words there. No, I, it's, I understand. It's the, I think someone can say, I know God elects the cell, the saved, that there's a, that there's a beyond just creation and mm-hmm. preservation that he, there's an election that happens to the saved. I don't know if there's the same type of election for the damned and they just leave that in a, in a, in a box of the extra step beyond necessarily scripture. Although you could say Romans nine. Yes. Um, and thus leave it in mystery, which is more what Lutherans do. Although we're even that's to impose too much thought on Lutherans in their own system. They get close to single mm-hmm. predestination. Mm. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Cause the only response that I have is it specifically states that God does not want those who are damned to go to hell. Mm-hmm. And so, and again, it states that in the canons of Dort, it affirms that God does not want the unsaved to go to hell. In contrast to many yeah. popular, yeah. popular young restless reformed or just reformed yes. common, like reformed totally. Baptist or a lot of reform, like the non-denominational reformed mm. who kind of flat out say that, mm. yep. you know, God wants the reprobate in hell for his glory. And it's like, yeah, wow. But yep. Josh is pointing out that is yep. not the position of yep. Dort, no. which means it's actually not a classically reformed in mm-hmm. the capital R sense of the word. Right. Yeah. Position. It might've been okay. for some of the people who followed it, but yeah, it's not in the actual canons itself. Yeah. Yeah. And the language will say like the first point of the first, the first article of the first point is, is that God is doing them no injustice mm-hmm. by condemning them. That because mm. of their sin, that it's not wrong that he sends them to hell. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that as the judge, he has the total box has been re- machine. Do you know? <laughs> but he did put them in the box. But that, that's different. We're not talking about free will and we'll get that. We'll, we'll, we'll find our own coffee metaphor for this problem. Yeah. Usually coffee analogies pot. take two or three steps to break down, but that one was just right off the bat, eh? <laughs> the claw. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good it's analogy, good. okay? No, I, I see what you're saying. Oh. I, all and my analogies are exactly the same. <laughs> They're all not useful. Yes. <laughs> did, did you want to add something to that? Joel? We've passed the point of relevance. It's not a big deal. Oh. Joel loves talking about extremes. I was going to... He thinks okay. they're all worth listening to. Yes, I think all extremes are worth listening to. Now, I, I believe that uh, the stupidity of extremes is they're all defined by their opposition and mm-hmm. less so than their core beliefs. Um but then on the on the other side of that, I don't respect uh, people who call themselves Molinists or Middleists because they're just sh- taking the buffet line a little bit. Um, Interesting. I respect see? the classical view where they're just like, does God's scripture? <laughs> and the yes, does yeah. God's scripture say X? Yes. Well, doesn't it also say Y? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the next point is irresistible. See? No relevance. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't talked about lim- limited atonement properly. You're right. Here, Here we go, go, folks. Yep. Oh, you're going to skip oh, limited by, atonement? By the way, um, Josh doesn't like this one. I think, do all four of us agree with the first, like tentatively at least, say, yeah, total depravity, yeah, election, as long as you're arguing it properly? Yes. I do. I do. Mm-hmm. No, and I'll get back to you. Okay. 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 Josh, is that a yes? Are you are you reformed? He's here? a five point. Hardcore. Am I Calvinist? Reformed? Yeah. What? Yeah, you just did it. Are you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I said you were going to do it. Actually, Josh, I am curious. Are you? Would you consider yourself five point tulip Calvinist? I know you don't like the whole label thing. Yes. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're a tuliper. <laughs> Let me stop you right there. I completely agree. I agree. <laughs> Though, because I hold the canons of Dort, I want it to be known that I can be corrected. So the truth is what matters, and truth will set you free. All right, yes. let's, let's do the L. Let's take the L. Limited atonement saves the elect and not those who are not elect. Mm-hmm. Yes. Claw machine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. It is often referred to in modern days as, what is it? Effect, effectual grace? What's the... Um, what? There's also hypothetical universalism. Well, no, it's, yeah. it's, no that's, that's the term. Like, so it, at the canons of Dort, 
one of the one of the English or the Anglican representatives was John Davenant, who's fantastic. Anyway, um, and him among there was I think there was four representatives. I could yeah, there's there a few from different denominations yeah. there. One of them, and they were split on the L. Yep, because John Davenant they couldn't take the, the L. Couldn't take the L. They're like, no, it is not L. Um, <laughs> they would argue, no, Christ atonement is not limited in that he only died for the elect mm-hmm. but he died for the sins of the whole world mm-hmm. and it is only efficacious yep. for the yep. elect which in retrospect has kind of become the standard yes capital r reformed position mm-hmm. however that was not always the case even historically in the reformed tradition there were many who said christ only died for the sins of the elect. They would do some gymnastics mm-hmm. um, about certain passages. Yes. So does this interact at all with um, the idea of common grace? Less so. Less so? The, the idea of common grace is more tied to God's goodness. So God is good even to the retrobate. Okay. Makes it rain on the just and the unjust. He's Yeah, that's, that's more what the, I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, that has more to do with he is good even to the to, to the those who oppose him. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and that is that is still out of his grace. Yes, mm-hmm. right. Um, but the grace which comes through the the propitiatory propitiatory sacrifice of Christ mm-hmm. is only applied mm-hmm. to the sins of the elect, right? As a direct opposition to universalism. Yeah, it should also be noticed that noted that universalism people who believe that everyone is saved tends to very heavily, almost exclusively be Armenians as well. Yeah. Not that Armenians are universalists. They're not. Not usually. Um, not going to lie. This is the one that I'm not on board with. This is one Sam, of them. This is the one that I have a lot of hard. It, it really depends what you mean. If we mean hypothetical universalism in that the extent of Christ's atonement, which I believe actually even in the art, even in the canons of Dort, it kind of says that Mm -hmm. that the extent of Christ's atonement could be universal, Mm -hmm. but it is only efficacious for For those who accept those who accept Mm. I'm, I'm conflicted because I don't think John. I also don't think that Peter says that that would be, and this, this would be where the, the internal consistency of the canons of Dort of the Calvinist system, or to use the term of tulip it is extremely consistent, mm-hmm. but the question of, is it biblical then is where things get hashed out. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, well, like, cause I think, sorry, carry on. No, it's all right. Um, when I'm right now, I'm reading through a lot of, uh, Peter that I have to do it for paper mm-hmm. and, uh, first Peter specifically, which is a very good book, by the way, you should read first Peter again. It's great. Um, and not just that, but also Ephesians and, Col- uh, Corinthians and Colossians and all these other places where, especially right now, for household codes and stuff like that. People talk about has household codes. That's the whole like how a uh, man and a woman should uh, act in relationship with each other under Christ, how a slave and a master, how a child and a parent should act with each other, whatever. Um, there's a weird amount of talk about how um, others will be saved through the actions of the believing. Um, and I don't really know exactly what to do with it. Yep. I just thought I'd bring it up here. <laughs> Because it does have to do directly with this limited atonement thing that if that if says that wives might save their husbands through their own belief, what does that mean? The unbelieving uh, husbands, by the way. Yeah. The pagans. Yeah. If they are saved through the wife's belief, if that is true, what does that mean for limited atonement? Well, yeah. What I does mean, that do just a free will in general or agency? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> what does that do about... It gets confusing. Yeah. I'm, I'm not bringing it up as a good point because yeah. obviously that's a very contentious and argued position, yeah. but my, so Josh, I had a thought while we were studying for this episode, we, this episode might go a little bit longer. Sorry guys. That's all right. Close, yeah. It's, it's going to be, topic. it's going to be a good episode though. Um, Josh, you know how, when we discussed the atonement theories episode, you came yes. away and I came away with Chris's Victor. Yeah. Emphasizing not that we disagree with one another in any way. It's just, um, there is an emphasis difference. Versus victory us. through penal substitution. Penal substitution. So that's what you guys came away with together. No, he emphasized penal substitution. Yes. And yep. I emphasized Chris's victor. Yeah. 
we don't disagree with one another that nope. they aren't there. It's just, those are our emphases. I have a question. If Christ's atoning, according to adjacent theologies of how we study, mm -hmm. if Christ's atoning sacrifice is primarily articulated in its soteriological implications, meaning the theology of salvation, it would make sense that the su penal substitution that Christ takes the wrath um, of, in this case, the elect only, mm -hmm. it would make sense that that it would make sense that you, if you're so focused on soteriological theology, which in this case, in our current episode, the idea of Christ's sacrifice as being the propitiatory sacrifice, propitiatory sacrifice for the sins of the elect. Mm -hmm. However, bear with me. If myself, who leans more to a, for lack of a better term, because I don't have a theological system that's backing me behind this, I just have, mm -hmm. yeah, a cosmic aspect in which Christ's death swallows up all of human sin mm -hmm. and death and then conquers it and then distributes the effects of that to those who believe on a Christus Victor side. And so our articulation of soteriology has actually manifested in our the way we prioritize theories mm -hmm. of atonement. So you said because of Christus Victor, like, like your affiliation with it, mm -hmm. that you believe that Christ's death is effective to conquer all of human sin. Did. Did. Yeah, yeah. Did. Yep. And that its effects are distributed to those who have He's faith. He's not talking about soteriology specifically, but no, just atonement. I'm, I'm saying that because we probably have this difference, yeah. and we could talk about the presuppositions of where exactly, because yeah. we haven't really. But because we have this difference of the presuppositions in a, in soteriology, yeah, yeah. you hold limited atonement. And I, even though I, I don't necessarily disagree, I just don't like the cat. I, I okay. don't wouldn't use those terms. It manifests in our the way we prioritized yes. our atonement theories. Sure, but to to understand what you what was it that you said is your position on limited atonement? I, I don't hold limited atonement. Yes, because I think Christ. Christ did not just pay for the sins of the elect. Yep. He paid for sin entire. Yes. The concept, the idea, the in, the, in a cosmic way. Right. Yep. Swallowed up sin and death. Um, not swallowed, paid for the sins, not just of the believers, but of the unbelievers as well. I think that that's really even that against the can of certain parts of the canons of Dort. Although, I think it's there's there's a term issue going on here that well th we this disagree is on. this is why when we're talking about Calvinism when we're doing it yeah we might refer to tulip and that's how we're generally outlining it we keep saying things like go to Dort read the things go through the whole thing because the tulip is kind of a bit of a lacking term when you just say limited atonement and you give the brief understanding of it yeah the canons of Dort has many different articles each talking about parts like this um, and emphasizing different aspects to make it so that you go. Therefore, this is the position that's meant by limited atonement, mm -hmm. which you might still disagree with. That, that's fine. But when people hear limited atonement and they read the quick blurb summary, whatever, mm -hmm. that's not quite enough. Some wiki article or some comment on Reddit. Yeah. Again, Redditors oh. don't read. <laughs> or worse yet, a YouTube short. Oof. Oh. Anyway, we're making more YouTube shorts. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I think what I, what I presented is, is not entirely hostile to most to, to many articles in Dort. And I think Josh is actually reading to try to show that to me. Um, we'll see though. It's going to fight. We should talk about it a little bit more when we actually get to the episode. Yeah. Um, Cause this will come up because yeah. I think this yeah. is one that I'm in a similar boat to Caleb. I might agree depending on what you mean. I might disagree depending on what you mean. Sure. It really depends on how you articulate. This is why I've kind of said I'm a like nearly perfect 50, 50 split on Tulip. Mm hmm. For me, the, the distribution of <laughs> yes. yes. There's no universalism. Yeah. The from cursory rereading. Yeah. The reason I dislike Tulip is because again, it is not the canons of Dort. Mm -hmm. The second point of the doctrine, Christ's death and human redemption through it, is the punishment which God's justice requires. The satisfaction made by Christ, 
the infinite value of Christ's death. This death of God's son is the only and entirely complete sacrifice and satisfaction for sins. It is the of infinite value and worth more than sufficient to atone for the sins of the whole world. More than here's, here's the, here's the difference. I totally agree. My question. Mm -hmm. The pseudo disagreement is I think it did, but it is not applied to each individual. You know what? You, you know that you you, you see the distinction that I'm trying to draw. Yes. Okay. Could you? That what you're saying is that it it did conquer all sins, mm -hmm. but the benefits are only applied to those who believed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only stating in Article Three mm -hmm. that benefits it is of a, salvation specifically, not the benefits of Christ's death. No. Mm -hmm. The Article Three is only saying that it's sufficient to destroy all sin. Not. I would say it's not just sufficient. It did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's still the rest of it. So I'm just saying that Article 3 is only dealing with the sufficiency. Yeah. It hasn't gotten to the application. Right. Mm. Because the rest of it doesn't state exactly in those terms whether for limited atonement in this case. It's setting it up. Or for the, the case you're stating. Mm -hmm. It simply states uh, after in the unbelief is man's responsibility. Um, the sacrifice Christ offered on the cross is so, uh, for example, however, that many who have been called through the gospel do not repent or believe in Christ, but, but perish in unbelief is not because the sacrifice of Christ offered on the cross is deficient mm -hmm. or insufficient, mm -hmm. but because they themselves gift yep. yep. simply states that it is, but all who genuinely believe and are delivered and saved by Christ's death from their sins and from this destruction received and, but all who genuinely believe and are delivered and saved by Christ's death from their sins and from destruction receive his favor solely from God's grace, which he owes to no one given to them in Christ from eternity. Yes. I don't. That's it. Which article? That's article seven of point. This might be worth getting more into when we actually yeah, do the yeah, episode because we we're yeah. getting a little in the weeds. I, I, mm. Okay, yes. Because I, underst I understand Caleb's point, I'm pretty sure, and I understand Josh's point that these canons of Dort specifically so far have not articulated one point or the other for this, yeah. for Caleb's argument. Mm -hmm. However, they are setting it up. Yeah. Um, and I would like, I'm curious because I did read over them, but mm -hmm. again, I don't, I'm not an encyclopedia. I don't know them by heart. Uh, I can't tell you which one would say against that or whatever, or say one way or the other. Um, but I'm sure the canon does come to a conclusion on that. Does make an a, affirmative claim on something about limited atonement. Not in the words, but in spirit. Yeah. Also, what I meant before by uh, Christ's death. Um, yes, soteriology-wise, you have to accept Christ for its effects to be given to you. But what I mean with more than just that, like it did affect the whole world. He did sit, help save the world in through like things like the kingdom, uh, the church who are supposed to make the world a better place mm -hmm. and stuff like that because of Christ's death. Which gets into Joel's common mm -hmm. grace. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The goodness of the gospel. The, there's many, there are effects of the gospel which mm -hmm. benefit all. Yeah. yeah. So if atonement's talking here specifically lo limited about salvation itself, mm -hmm. then yes. Yeah. Talking about grace in general? I don't think so, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. Yeah, because I do not, I specifically agree with Caleb. You think his argument is the, the more proper one that you would get out of this? You're saying I agree with Dort? Dort? I think so. Okay, I'm going to have to, re I'll, we'll get back to this. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I, Yeah. I've been told I don't. Well, I think there's a difference between agreeing with and not yet being inconsistent with. Well, and this, oh, is, this, there you go. this is the point that I'm making. Yes. Do you agree with Tulip? Probably not. Do you agree with Dort? I believe so. Okay. Okay. All we'll right. get into it when we get into our, when we yeah. take the L on our episode. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm making mm -hmm. the same joke because otherwise we're talking about big words. Yeah. Fair enough. Totally. And that leads us to the I in Tulip. We're just about done. Irresistible grace. 
Mm -hmm. That, because of my sin due to total depravity and then sinful nature, Mm -hmm. for me or anyone to be saved must be saved by God, the free gift of faith. Mm. Uh, The rejection of the gospel is completely our responsibility because of sin. Okay. And those who believe, believe because God has given them the gift of faith. Here's the thing. Your phraseology, I don't think I disagree with. Mm -hmm. Can I I use a different phraseology? You can tell me if if I'm wrong. And now you can say that's not the phraseology of Dort. Fair enough. We can get into the weeds on that if we want. What you mean is efficacious calling. Yes. A calling that does not fail. The answer will be yes, because he calls those he, he predestined, mm-hmm. whom he glorified, whom mm-hmm. he, he justified. Predestined, yeah. This has got that problem of gracism. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Gracism. Gracism? Yeah. <laughs> oh. When, uh, better not well, be a gracist. If somebody genuinely doesn't, understand the gospel or doesn't agree mm-hmm. with um scripture then your belief is well god didn't let you agree with scripture then <laughs> and it's like oh that's yeah. disappointing or god didn't give you faith no. well right? they, and like i i get it like uh i believe help my own belief like we yeah. i get it i understand where he's coming from but it does lead to some anti-evangelical stuff every once in a while and again um i want to state there, there's solutions in the door. I understand. No, 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 no. Um, I, I believe that yes. like any true thing, mm-hmm. corrupt human individuals yes. will sinfully understand mm-hmm. or present the theology yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and in will a, live by that. In a point in its favor, though, even though I don't agree with irresistible grace, um, mm-hmm. I do think that uh, one of the points in its favor, when Jesus talks about things like um, they hear, but do not listen. They see, uh, mm-hmm. they have eyes, but they do not, they do not see. Um, plus all the other parts of the Bible of they, uh, they've heard the words, but they reject it within their hearts. Their hearts mm-hmm. have been hardened that God hardened their hearts. All yep. of these different things show, um, point towards that. God is the one reaching out and either opening people's hearts or is the one reaching out and giving them the faith to believe. And one However, of the, I don't agree with <laughs> more explicit ones is when Jesus is talking with the, after the parable of the four seeds mm-hmm. and they get taught what it is. And he's like, and this is for you. Mm-hmm. And they're like, why are you using parables? And he's like, lest they believe. Yeah. Right. Which is what? Yes. <laughs> At the same but time. I yeah. point more to divine plan stuff with that. Mm-hmm. But I see what, I see what you mean. Hidden yeah. Messiah yes. stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All well, that. Potentially. Yeah. I, th- I agree. I think it, there's, there's two reasons why I struggle with this one. Mm-hmm. One is which, um, what does that do really about, like you can believe in unconditional election without holding to a efficacious calling, mm-hmm. right? Or irresistible grace. Um, but those two combined create some very uncomfortable things. It, it creates the conclusion of the fifth point. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Not necessarily. I don't think yeah. it helps. It helps. Yeah. But I don't yeah, think the fifth point is the yeah. fifth point, but yeah. And, and, and I think like if we're going to be doing stuff, pulling out Bible stuff, um, you also have many passages in, in the new Testament mm-hmm. and the old Testament, but more specifically, let's say the new Testament where there is, you know, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you'd, you know, mm-hmm. come to me, I would cover you like a hen that covers mm-hmm. her chicks but you are not willing Mm -hmm. and you have other passages where it seems as though the gospel is presented. The Holy spirit is at work in the preaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's up to the people to receive. Now, again, Calvinism Mm -hmm. is very internally coherent. Mm -hmm. The question generally by people who reject it is, is it biblical? Yes. Um, so the main... This is the one I think devolves most into philosophizing. Yeah. Um, this is people not talking as much about what the Bible says, although people will reference the Bible, but rather what they believe that the Bible means. Mm-hmm. So there, there is not... 
what the Bible means and specifically in terms of their own philosophy, mm. how they, how they think, how they, how they've rationalized these things. Well, you need to philosophize to kick the can a little bit, right? Cause it's like, well, why didn't they accept? Well, cause they never, we're never going to, what right. if they accept later? Mm. Well, because that's when they were destined to. Right, like it gets right. a little bit. Well, well uh, again, it's not just simply destined. Okay, is, destined's the wrong word. Well, but. no, no, no. It's mm-hmm. that is still the case. Yes, but it is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, through means and through mm-hmm. history and through time. Yeah, right. and so the main two points that I just want to gospel: the fact that many who are called through the ministry of the gospel uh, and do not come are not brought to conversion, must not be blamed on the gospel, nor on Christ who is offered through the gospel, nor on God who calls them through the gospel and even bestows various gifts on them, but on the people themselves who are called. Some in self-assurance do not even entertain the word of life. Others do entertain it, but do not take it to heart. And for that reason, after fleeting joy of temporary faith, they relapse Others choke the seed of the word with the thorns of life's cares and with the pleasures of the world and bring forth no fruit. This is directly quoted from the sorry, parable, the parable. Yeah. So I should also preface unless you're kind mm-hmm. of a Pelagian mm-hmm. or semi Pelagian, even those who say God's call is not entirely efficacious. There is a mystery of synergism in there. Mm-hmm. Yep. But, um, when if somebody were to say, okay, so faith is choice, and they go, no, faith is a gift. So mm-hmm. You're saying your salvation is a work of God and your work? No, they go, the salvation is a work of God. It's just, where is the box of mystery located? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And if you're a plague and you say that, none of this is real. Yeah, you go, I know it is just me working with God, my yep. own salvation. And it should be mm-hmm. said that even <laughs> though I do disagree with this, um, with I... I'm not a Pelagian. I do think that, yes. like you said, Caleb, the mystery is somewhere else than where the Calvinists would point. Yeah. AKA humans have some influence. What that is and what that means, I don't know. But it has to be somewhere in a sense. And we'll get more into that when we mm-hmm. go deeper. <laughs> yes. Because it's not even clear, even though Colton and I may disagree with Mm-hmm the Calvinist on this point that it's not even clear that we agree with each other. No, I don't think we do. <laughs> no. Probably not. Uh, and that leads into the fifth and final point, uh, which is the perseverance of the saints. Uh, so article three of the fifth point, the God's perseverance of the converted because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them. And also because of the temptation of the world and Satan those who have been converted could not remain standing in his grace if left to their own resources. But God is faithful, mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them and powerfully preserving them in it to the end. Amen. Amen. I am very sympathetic towards this position. Mm-hmm. But then the, the straw man of it is once saved, always saved, mm-hmm. which um, becomes difficult for anyone who's familiar with you know backsliding yeah but yep. i mean you have passages where it's like hey if he goes out from us he was never with us he was mm-hmm. never of us yeah but then you get into how do you deal with hebrews yep mm-hmm. like the like the entirety of hebrews almost yeah so there's that yeah That's- i find preservation of the saints very very difficult because like in in my mind and this is Honestly, I think it might be influenced by monastic tradition, but every wandering from God is another chance to return. Whereas the opposite would be, um, if you leave, you were never doing anything to begin with. And I think that's reductive to spiritual growth. Oh, I think it's, can I counter for a second? Go for it. Is not the work of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. the work which transforms believers into Christ, who is in the will, of, who follows the will of God, who um, is it for us a continual a continual relationship into an ever deepening spiritual spiritual relationship with Christ, which is ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit, which ultimately is who called us and gave us the mm-hmm. gift of faith to begin with. Yeah, He is faithful and will bring it to completion, and so. The question, yeah, he who began a good work in you will bring it through to completion, the, mm-hmm. the Philippians passage. The question of that would be, 
and this is why, again, why Cal- why the Calvinism is extremely co- internally coherent. Yeah, is well, then you're saying, and this is not what I'm saying. You're saying, yeah. Does God fail? Does God fail? <sighs> Did God fail to bring that person to salvation? If it's you know what I mean, yeah, that would be it's that all, would be the, if it's all yeah, on him. Well, it must yeah. be his fault. Yeah. Well, my mind goes to the prodigal immediately, mm. right? That there is, there is room within the gospel to, to leave and come back. And still that being a, an all encompassing experience of the gospel, you know, that there isn't necessarily, um, <laughs> I hear people all the time talking about like God's working on my testimony, right? <laughs> what they really mean is like, I don't want to go to church right now. <laughs> Just that's, like, yeah. you know, that's, that happens. But, um, I, I don't know. I I think it's very difficult to disregard. We'll say somebody's saved twice in their life. Okay. They have two salvation experiences, we'll say. And one is like when they're, you know, younger or whatever. And then 10 years pass and they don't do much with, with God. And they, you know, we'll call them backslidden. Right. And then 10 years later, even to the point they where they up the cross reject again. God openly. Yes. Yeah. To the point they reject God openly. Yeah. And then they pick up their cross again at one point, rededicate their life to, to Christ. Um, do you believe that the Holy Spirit was only working in that second here's, time of salvation? Here's my thing. I don't follow the internal in- consistency of Calvinism. Mm-hmm. I think because of the author of Hebrews, those who have tasted, those who have seen and have walked away, it is impossible again to restore them to salvation. But they will be crucifying Christ again. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Here, I, I can find the, the scripture verse. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. I'm... Um, and I'm heavily paraphrasing here. Yeah. Those who have tasted and seen mm-hmm. the goodness of God, for them to walk away again mm-hmm. is, they, it would be better for them to have never known. Yeah. For, the, for them to essentially for them to come back to faith would be to crucify Christ over again. That's the, the th- it's rough as someone who grew up in the Christian household. Um, as someone who decidedly got all of a sudden weirdly, um, testimonial, um, as someone who grew up in a Christian household. And then I would say effectively just didn't care about my relationship with Christ. And in all intensive purposes, kind of just, walked away Mm -hmm. with that. No, God preserved me in my Mm -hmm. time of walking away. Mm -hmm. It's not as though I was not saved in that time. Yeah. God, God at at least. And preserved me in my, in my failure. Anyway, and as far as, as far as I'm aware, Dort does accommodate this idea that they are being divinely chastened. Yes. Uh, I think it's first John that talks about this or whatever. Am, yep. I, am I getting it right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remembered something for once. <laughs> um, yeah. Where uh, those who do walk away or become weaker in the faith, um, when they come back, that is God bringing them back into the yeah. fold, um, chastening them to bring them into a greater and back to him. Mm-hmm. Again, not letting them go, not leaving them behind, but this mm-hmm. idea of that there still but, has to be something. But they were always part of that elect. Yes. That and is the idea. Yeah. They, so they didn't opt in and out. These yep. are just three short articles that go through this whole okay. discussion we're having. The dan- and this is right after God's perseveration, perserva- preservation of the converted that mm-hmm. we just read before. So the danger of true believers falling into serious sins. Although that power of God strengthening and preserving true believers in grace is more than a match for the flesh, yet those converted are not always so activated and motivated by God that in certain specific actions, they cannot by their own fault depart from the leaning of grace, be led astray by the desires of the flesh and give in to them. And so if Peter can deny Christ, to what extent right. is this falling into sin allowed? Mm-hmm. And um, it does seem like they're not stupid people. The people who wrote the Dort uh, <laughs> yeah. canon, they're not dumb. They obviously thought about these things. Mm-hmm. And while, again, I disagree with this one, Mm-hmm. They they cover it at least. 
the next, the effects of such serious sins, which is by s- such monstrous sins, however, they greatly offend God, deserve the sentence of death, grieve the Holy Spirit, suspend the exercise of faith, severely wound the conscience, and sometimes lose the awareness of grace for a time. Those that lose the awareness of grace yeah. for a time. Okay. Interesting. Until they have returned to the way by genuine repentance, God's fatherly face again shines upon them. Mm. Then, God's saving intervention for God, who is rich in mercy, according in his unchangeable purpose of election, does not take his Holy Spirit from his own completely, even when they fall grievously. Neither does he let them fall down so far that they forfeit the grace of adoption and the state of justification or commit the sin which leads to death, the sin against the Holy Spirit and plunge themselves entirely forsaken by him into eternal ruin. Right. And the argument is that those who do commit those sins were never saved in the first place. Never elect. Mm-hmm. They just had a, an appearance. And right. that gets it to John's. Yeah. If he departs from us, he was never one of us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to the, the statement with the four types of seed, where there's yeah. those that you cannot deny the fact that there are those that believe in some sense and mm-hmm. yep. in the end walk away. In that case, because th- this isn't my only argument against this point, mm-hmm. and we'll get into it when we actually talk about it fully. Um, what do you do with people like, uh, man, you guys know way more about these people than I do. Things like televangelists or, or Joel Osteen, mm-hmm. very clearly in their youth or younger days, had a very clear op- firebrand per, um, preaching of the gospel, wanted to do it. Even, um, what's the Mars Hill guy, Driscoll, uh, yep. Mark Driscoll, yeah. who um, I would argue for all of these people clearly were saved, clearly brought people to Christ, all of these kinds of things. We're mm-hmm. doing the works of God. And then Driscoll, I don't know the end stuff as much. Um, and obviously, uh, Osteen's still alive. Um, watch our Augustine Osteen so stuff. So is Driscoll. Too. We'll have to play Is Driscoll out. alive? Oh, yep. yeah. Dude, he's, he's a current pastor still. In a oh. different state yeah. and teaching Ar- Arminianism now. And most... Really? Yeah. 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 And, and says he never taught Calvinism. Fun. Very fun. Yeah. And then he's mostly just doing like weird gender stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not a big fan of Driscoll, but I'm also really not a fan of Osteen yeah. either. So well, <laughs> I, both of these people I would consider to have once been Christian, but are not. Driscoll might be, I, I don't know as much about him, but I don't know. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I think he's led too many people and done too many bad things. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think he preaches like, the gospel. At least See, that's different though. You said he's done, he's hurt too many people and he's done bad things. Sorry, that, that's more what I meant by bad things. Okay. He isn't like, like I don't consider the hurting bad people necessarily. I, th- I see that as an offshoot of his character mm-hmm. rather than, you know, like the other way around. Sorry, I got a little specific there. No, it's all right. But um, with these people, I'm, I'm talking about these specifics, but I mean generally people like this. Um, when I find it hard to say they were never elect. Okay, well, elect is the wrong word because I'm front loading stuff or back loading stuff, but they were never saved. They clearly did the missions and works of God. Mm-hmm. They had the spirit within them and did physical acts of God. However, they clearly don't have it anymore. Yeah. Mm. I would say that because of the teaching of reprobation in point one, mm-hmm. that I cannot state whether he was elect or not. But Josh, is that God calling? <laughs> oh, Jesus is going to come and read me out now. <laughs> I cannot state whether he is elect or not, but I can, as this passage says, he may have believed mm-hmm. as canons, as the canon state that people can believe. Right. But it would be only nominally. Yes. How do you account for like the actual fruit that he's produced? Again, I cannot state whether he's elect. I'm not, I can yeah, only well, sense you that he believes. Right, but if he, if he shows especially things like the work of the Spirit and the fruit that comes from mm-hmm. that, that is only for those who have been saved. You'd yeah. have to make a case that but he actually does. For example, I think Balaam, he has. For example, Balaam speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit prophecy. Right, but that one's pretty explicitly not like that's that is the donkeys from God, but Balaam's not from God. No, 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 no. But the Balaam speaks the prophecies of God and acknowledges that God is God. The continuation of his life dies in the battle because of right. his denial of God. Yeah, 
And false teachers are sent to Israel and are sent to the church mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from God. Yep. To test them. Yep. Preaching as, a different as, gospel. Yep. Well, as it state that the, but the they didn't if, if someone a else was my point. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. You don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I, I'm tentative on on preservation of the saints, mostly for biblical reasons, not for systematic reasons. Mm-hmm. Even though I understand that those things blur together, whatever. Right. Um, I have biblical reasons too, but this one sticks with me a lot. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's yes, it's difficult. Um, if I'm if I'm the Calvinist, I'm I suppose I would have to make the argument that. If he were to leave the faith, um, he, he was extremely passionate, preached the gospel. Um, however, were to then begin to preach a different gospel that he departed from us because he was never one of us. I keep saying it, but right. it's kind of the thrust of that text. Yeah, but the, the you, big- can, you can just respond, well, what about Hebrews? fair <laughs> no I, I i wouldn't because hebrews yeah fair but <laughs> hebrews has both sides of the argument yeah, yeah it's, it's so, rough um the thing i would say is then how do you do if it was a good faith attempt and it turned not that is god it would have to be god specifically turning the screws to harden their heart yeah however they had a good faith and legitimate attempt in the first place that's the problem yep yeah. And then we get into how does assurance work within the Calvinistic system, which yeah. is rough. Just wait. So you're saying that because they believed and now they don't, God removed faith from them? Mm. The argument I think the Calvinists would make, have to make is either that or say they were never saved. And I don't see how they could say they were never saved. Therefore, they must say God hardened their heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we'll get into it when we talk about the actual mm-hmm. pers- perseverance, whatever, the, the P of the saints. Mm-hmm. Um, Excuse me? I can't remember the word. Perseverance. Perseverance, Perseverance, not preservation. But um, either way, this is one that I've wrestled with, I think, the most. And it's the one that I think I'm the hardest against. The reason I say that is because in the passage in Deuteronomy where it says, if a prophet comes to you claiming to Mm -hmm. worship other gods, like to lead you to other gods, performs signs and wonders, Mm -hmm. or... Right. But preaches something other than the name of God. And yeah. that's more my point. No, he's giving a list. And yep. so, but it says that the false prophet sent by God can perform signs and wonders, which yep. is tied to the plagues of Egypt. Yep. And the miracles of Jesus are tied to the plagues of Egypt mm-hmm. in signs and wonders. Mm-hmm. So the unsaved, the mm-hmm. false prophet can do work. By the Holy Ab- Spirit. Absolutely. Corinthians says the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Even an angel of light comes to you, but they preach another gospel at that point. And in, in uh, mm-hmm. Exodus and Deuteronomy, it's saying specifically those, they may come to do this and God is testing you specifically. Mm-hmm. They will not preach my name is Mormonism. his point. Yes. Mormons are exactly <laughs> yeah. a good point. Yeah. Uh, I would say Islam is also the same, but um, like these I would, Osteen might even be in that camp. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I don't know much about the whole, uh, about his young mm-hmm. life and all that. Yep. But I do think that there are people out there who did have a legitimate attempt and a legitimate, um, I don't want to say try because that implies that it wasn't actually true, mm-hmm. but legit, they legitimately believed the actual Orthodox things in their youth and then moved away from it. If, yep. if, if we and believe. So they're not preaching a different gospel. They're not. They don't believe they're not here to test other believers. They actively and truly believe in the words of God with the actual efficacious um, works that come with that and the fruit that comes from that. We don't know it's efficacious. No, I'm saying the works are efficacious that people came to faith because of Osteen in his youth, but we don't get to decide if they're efficacious is what he's saying is F the, the effect of the work is not determined by the individual. Therefore, if he's not actually aligned with God, that doesn't really matter because God's going to perform the work whether he likes it or not. Is that, is that okay? I think it's more complicated at? than that, but sure. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to make it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I uh, think. I think it is, to, but we'll talk about to it To end this episode, I think that joke has to land. 
I th- I will definitely resurface this conversation in the multi part Calvinism it's a good idea. breakdown. I was but, being sarcastic, by the way. No, no, no. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I the we're just going to devolve, and I think Colton brings up good points. Fight yeah. time. No. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how we ended up on opposite sides of stuff because I thought we were the closest out of everybody. But I also thought, but I mean, we, we might be, and we might I just think have to we, talk about. It. I disagree with at least four of the points of Cal- Calvinism. So Calvinism, Calvinism, that's good. I disagree with two and a half. Oh. You only two and a half? Yeah, um, the L I, I wrestle with. <laughs> yeah. I and P, no. Yeah, I'm I'm more disagreeing with your point system of who's saved and who's not. But that's my biggest thing. Okay. And that's uh, arguably doesn't even fit in the Calvinist part of the debate. So it could be something else entirely. It's just general soteriology. I'm like 60 to 80%. Mm-hmm. Somewhere you got to use the same metrics. Are you, are you three, four, five? What are you? Yes. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, that's good. I see you're a fence leader. Right? That's me. No, I'm just kidding. I you am, do a great job of rating things in this show. I am the Via Medea. Mm-hmm. The middle way. There's someone who's going to get that. Uh, and I don't even think they're in this room. No, nope, one got it. Medea is the the movies. Yeah, oh, with, no. uh, <laughs> that, can't be, no. that can't be what you're referencing. No. Um, somebody's gonna get it. Josh. No, I looked at. No, you don't remember my name, do you? Ah, we lived together John. for five years. <laughs> His name's Cole. Joel. Oh, Thank oh, you man. for the help. It rhymed. You're welcome. Um, Joel. Yeah. Please end this episode before end I episode? Episode? other one people's second. names. Cole, we should wrap up no what is what is what are you wanting josh josh is typing something on his keyboard furiously read the canons of dort yeah pretty cool uh and they are a bit heady they're not very easy as of read if you don't know what the ignorance is mean. bliss just skip it oh, <laughs> also also read the remonstrance that would be yep. the armenian the what response back jacob armenius the remonstrance the, how you um, the the quote from spurgeon from a book i read on his called the defense of calvin it was it's like 30 minutes audiobook um and he states um for himself that he's like uh he's like regard regardless of calvinism but the reason i believe in it is because i i look at myself and i see my sin and i can't imagine that i wasn't saved by any other way it's beautiful Mm -hmm. it's again it's just him yeah yeah spurgeon's wrong though no i'm just kidding (laughs) he is the prince of preachers yep um He's a pretty I cool am guy. Spurgeon. It's, <laughs> that's that's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, read Canis Dort. Mm-hmm. Read the actual re, the Rebuttal. articles of the Remonstrance, mm-hmm. um, and then for inter reformed reflection, read the relevant passages in the uh, mm-hmm. thirty nine articles. That'd be the Anglic- Anglican mm-hmm. Confession and the relevant passages in the Book of Concord. That'd be the Lutheran mm-hmm. Confession, right? And realize read that, the Bible. that even, even the, sorry, the reformed, the Genevan school mm-hmm. of thought, the Genevan school of soteriology to the Armenian school aren't the only inner reformed positions on this issue. Yep. But anyway, sorry. You don't um, have to believe in one or the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those aren't the only things in the market. Yes. Yeah. Wrapper. Wrapper up. If you want to. Check out the rest of our episodes. Go to secondratesaints.com. If you'd like to support us, you can uh, click on the link there to buymeacoffee.com. Um, if you would like to keep an eye on what we're doing, you can check out our Instagram or our uh, X, although we are not uh, posting on there very often. Um, but give us something to post about. Uh, message us or something. I don't know. Do something. I'm tired. Hi, tired. It's like one in the morning right now. No. That's not true. <laughs> Holy moly. You it's four attack. in the morning, actually. <laughs> oh, oh it's man. somewhere. Josh, it's four o'clock in the morning somewhere. Am I right, guys? There's a little red button <laughs> a little red on button the device there. Don't where press we it, record on. I got plenty no, more to I say. really enjoy send this. Us, send us comments right now on why Calvinist, we're wrong. We're predestined to be wrong. Um, uh, Spurgeon also said, uh, not all Calvinists are going to heaven. And that's <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. I think a lot of Calvinists would say that actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, like, and uh, he looks forward to meeting all of his Armenian friends there. That's good. <laughs> Spurgeon's great. Yeah. Read Spurgeon, honestly. He's great. He's old. Yeah, he's, so he's the old. prince of preach. He's a Baptist. He's all up. He should be. He should be all over. It's John Chrysostom. 
and then Spurgeon, Spurgeon and then yeah. everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joel, you miss Joel Osteen there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, somewhere as, down the line. I think as far I as think speaking, we crap one of the on Joel Osteen I think we too need, much. I think we need to list our favorite uh, televangelists right now. Guys, uh, Colton, there's a real, there's a red button. Joel Osteen's <laughs> my favorite. He's the only one I Mine's Joel I, Osteen. Yeah. When I did my internship, we listened to a Joel Osteen inspiring quote every morning before yeah. we began. That's where we're having the church. A, we're bringing back Osteen versus Augustine. And I'm, I'm not kidding. We're not. Pretty encouraging. Oh, no. <laughs> like, not even going to lie. Like, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to live my best life now. Yeah. Like, that's, I, that's, <sighs> that's unbelievable. Um, don't, don't. Well, I should start doing that. You can actually Osteen's buy an pretty encouragement. Bad. Uh, you, What's bad about Osteen? Tell me one thing. Prosperity. When he sold a seat to Kanye for six grand, that's not a bad thing. He wants more, <laughs> private, he wants more private jets than I have silverware. Well, that's cool. And you got to get more silverware, dude. <laughs> that doesn't sound like maybe... Uh, I know, I, I know degrees of issue. evil <laughs> is, I was going to say that all of, uh, I know degrees of like bad is still bad and it doesn't matter, yeah. but he is the least offensive. That's because of the hair though. You look at him, you're like, that's a hot of dude. The, like big ones. He is, he is one of the biggest because of that though. That's the problem. Yeah. What is hair? I just yeah. love the Kenneth Copeland, the hair grow back now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kenneth Copeland's like actually like the way people talk about Kenneth Co- or the way people talk about Joel Osteen. They should be talking about Kenneth Copeland because that guy's yeah. crackpot and saying <laughs> that yes. guy, yeah. that guy <laughs> might sometimes like it's real when his voice changes and he starts speaking a different language. Yeah. Like I swear he's almost <sighs> like, yeah. okay, hit the record button. That's like, Kenneth Kenneth Copeland is like three of the worst I don't, I don't know if he's possessed. I'm going to hit the button. I don't know if he's possessed, possessed right there. but I could believe it. Joel Osteen's not possessed. He's guy. prosperous. Dork, dork, dork. That might end up at the end.